Do you have investigated brain activity during motor imagery in stroke patients with hemiparesis? Hemiparesis is, is uh, motor impairment from, from, uh, from the stroke. This work is exa aimed at examining similarities between motor imagery and execution in a group of stroke patients. Eleven patients were asked to perform a visuomotor tracking task by either physically or mentally tracking a sine wave force target using their thumb and index finger. So they're doing this during fMRI scanning. Results, whole brain analysis confirmed shared neural substrates between motor imagery and motor execution in bilateral premotor cortex. And so that's the part that I was talking about. I won't tell you about the rest of the brain. In parietal lobule is, is partly associated with body recognition. So, so basically, I, I, I showed you that study because it it, it's, one, it's one of the studies that lend credence to what I was just describing, is that imagery is the precursor to action, and that it's associated. You get the imagery going here, and the action there. Think about, think about thinking, think, act. That's roughly how it works. Okay, now, now down to cognitive ability. Well, how can you conceptualize intelligence? Well, this is a major problem because your initial conceptualization determines in part the strategies that you're going to use to investigate intelligence. And when you say, when you, when you pare a sentence down to what is intelligence, the sentence is problematic because part of it is a question about if and how such a thing might manifest itself in the world. So there's a fact out there, that, or a set of facts, that corresponds to intelligence. But the other problem is, well, what do you mean when you say intelligence? And you kind of have to nail that down if you're going to have a conversation about intelligence that doesn't go entirely astray. And so you've got, a, you've got a definitional problem as well as an empirical problem. And so there have been, and this was especially true in the 1990s, People have been studying intelligence, IQ intelligence, since the 1920s, and, and it is a very well-established branch of psychology. One of the things I have to tell you about it, IQ research is that if you don't buy IQ research, you might as well throw away all the rest of psychology. And the reason for that is that the psychologists, first of all, who developed intelligence testing were among the early psychologists who instantiated the statistical techniques that all psychologists use to verify and test all of their hypotheses. So you end up throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And the IQ people have defined intelligence in a more stringent, stringent and accurate way than we've been able to define almost any other psychological construct. And so if you toss out the one that's most well-defined, then you're kind of stuck with the problem of what are you going to do with all the ones that you have left over that are nowhere near as well-defined or as well-measured or as, or as uh, or, or whose predictive validity is much less and has been demonstrated with much less vigor and clarity. Anyways, despite all that, people have posited a number of different intelligences, and reasonably so, because there's a, if you think of intelligence as that which might move you forward successfully in the world, obviously there's a fair number of phenomena that are associated with individuals that might fit into that category. So we have... People have made these distinctions. Bob Sternberg, for example, is distinguished between practical versus analytical intelligence, and he kind of thinks of practical as like street smarts and has a attempted to dissociate that from the kind of analytical intelligence that, um, that characterizes more straight IQ research. I, I don't think he's done it successfully as well at all, and since the 1990s, interest in his practical intelligence has declined precipitously because when it is matched head-to-head -head with standard IQ intelligence, the in IQ intelligence eats up all the variability. What's really happened, as far as I can tell so far, is that when we're trying to predict people's course through life, IQ does a very good job, and then one of the traits does a very good job as well, which is conscientiousness. But it doesn't do as good a job as IQ. Now, that partly might be because we can't measure conscientiousness very well. We're stuck with self-reports, or maybe I could gather peer reports about you, or I could gather your parents' reports about your teachers' reports, and each of those seems to pick up a little bit 
more of the pattern because you know yourself but other people know you differently than you know yourself and there's still some accuracy in that you can get multiple rater reports of something like conscientiousness and that'll up its predictive validity but in the final analysis the best you seem to be able to do with conscientiousness is about a 0.4 correlation with long-term performance whereas with IQ in complex jobs you can probably get 0.5 and maybe 0.6 and so 0.5 is 25% of the variance you got to square it 0.6 is 30%, 36% of the variance, and 0.4 is 16% of the variance. So even at the low end, let's say high end for conscientiousness is 0.4 or 16%. Low end for IQ is 0.5 or 25%. Low end estimates of IQ make it one and a half times more powerful than the high end estimates of conscientiousness. And I think that's about right. You'd think, why do we even have to debate this? And because it's so bloody obvious to me that intelligence is a major predictor of life success. I mean, you people, I've measured the IQ of University of Toronto people. You know, people in this room who have an IQ of less than 120 are rare. Well, why? Well, smart people go to university. Now, is that actually a contentious statement? Well, it shouldn't be a contentious statement. It's self-evident. Universities are actually set up so that smart people could expand their abilities. That's why they were there, 